H. Stephen Glenn is an internationally acclaimed family psychologist who speaks to over 200,000 people each year. He has been a featured speaker at the White House, where he was honored by Nancy Reagan as one of the nation's most outstanding family life and prevention professionals. Steve is a consultant on training, education, alcoholism, and drug abuse to agencies throughout the United States. He has served as director of the United States Office of Education Southeast Regional Training Center and director of the National Drug Abuse Training Center in Washington, D.C. He has also served on the board of directors of the National Congress of the Parent Teachers Association. Steve is co-author of Raising Self-Reliant Children in a Self-Indulgent World, as well as the author of several outstanding training series, including Developing Capable People, and is a primary contributor of the Lion's Quest International programs, Skills for Living and Skills for Adolescents. He has helped raise four biological children and several foster children who've learned from him and who've also been his teachers in the process of developing capable people. Please welcome H. Stephen Glenn. Thank you very much. How many capable people do I have in this group? Okay, capable of what? Oh, we better <laughs> be careful what we say there, but if anything's led you to the conclusion that you are a capable person, what kinds of experiences can you identify as you think back that have caused you to have that kind of confidence that, that I, can, I can do things, I can learn things, I, I'm in control? Any of you? So you're told you were loved for just how you were. Yeah. Didn't have to do anything. You were just okay right out of the starting gate. That's really yeah. nice. My mother told me I could do anything I wanted to with my hands. Okay, so now you had your mother encouraging you to discover that you could do anything you wanted to if you would try, or anything you set out to do if you would try. What happened for, for you? Graduated from college after 17 years of part-time isn't that beautiful? <laughs> After 17 years of effort, you graduated from college. Okay, now I find that after 17 years of effort, I think I'm going to graduate from parenting. <laughs> okay? Uh, what I'm celebrating most of all is that in spite of genetics and heredity, uh, three out of four of our kids have shown some capacity to be self-reliant and have, have moved out <laughs> and are having lives of their own. So. Uh, no matter what, if you just keep after it, something good's likely to happen near the end. So uh, for you, 17 years now, look what that gives you for the rest of your life. Anyone else? How about this side? I had all capable people on this side. Oh, there you go. You're willing to take the risk. Uh, I just pretty much walked into my daughter's room and just started. So you, is that something you've never done before? Never done before. So I just took the risk to hang wallpaper for the first time? Well, and I don't see any paste. <laughs> okay, at this point in time, so you know you you at least got out from under it. Okay, okay. Well, what I what I'd like to focus on in this session is how we go about helping people who may not believe they're that capable begin to discover that they are capable people, because all if all of our attitudes and behaviors and motivation comes from our beliefs, and if I don't truly believe I'm a capable person. Uh, then I'm going to have great difficulty with all of those that could be opportunities to learn and grow. They're going to overwhelm me. And I love it in research when people studying many different issues from very different perspectives arrive at the same place. Because in today's busy world where we have a lot to do and very little time to do it, that suggests that there is a common base for experience that if we can hit it often, will pay off in many different areas. And what I'd like to share in this session really is one of those wonderful points where things are coming together around a, sp a small but manageable set of things that if we can concentrate on them and make them priorities, they pay off in lots and lots of ways. The first area that I, I found what I'm going to share with you in this session in was some research that was done when it was discovered that the best predictor of adults' influence over young people during the developmental years is how strong or weak the young person's perceptions are that there is closest in trust between them and that adult, particularly by or beyond the age of 11. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, peer influence is generally by default. Most adolescents want to find adults that they look up to who will listen to them, take them seriously, not judge them, uh, and they only go to their peers generally who they know and they say, don't know much more about life than I do, but at least they don't make each other feel dumb for having the question, they tend to only go to peers 
when they're afraid of adults. They're afraid that, uh, that they don't know adults very well or that adults don't take time for them or that adults will judge them if they tell them what's going on in their mind. We find as soon as you can break down that barrier, it's quite probable adults will have as much effect during the teenage years as peers do, but it takes that closeness and trust. So we began to look at what interaction between adults and young people prevent closeness and trust from being achieved and maintained in that relationship. And we found five behaviors that occur literally daily in almost all contacts between people that particularly occur between the young and old, and whenever they occur, they tend to work against the, the closeness and trust they will ultimately need. Another line of research looking at the issue of self-confidence and self-esteem asks what interaction between adults who raise, teach, supervise, or involve with young people tend to work against healthy self-esteem, self-confidence, initiative, and found the same five behaviors showing up there. Another group of us doing research on the significant seven that we've talked about before, the perceptions that I am a capable person whose life is significant, who has power within me to influence things, who has acquired self-discipline, interpersonal skills, responsibility, and judgment, what we call the significant seven, found that the same five behaviors prevent growth in all of these areas from being consistent and at a maximum level in most of our daily contacts. So what I'm about to show you are five behaviors that I personally believe have occurred since the beginning of time in all settings in which someone who saw themselves as more mature or more capable than another dealt with that person or wherever people see themselves as responsible for another person. And that's an Achilles heel for most of us. Most of us today feel very, very responsible for what our children become. And there's a large amount of data from the past that says if you don't handle weaning and potty training correctly, you'll ruin them forever, and uh, lots and lots of those kinds of things. So a lot of us live with tremendous performance anxiety. The problem is the harder we try to determine what our children will be, the more compelled they are to be the opposite, to have an identity of their own. Very, very helpful and important for people today to realize that without grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, lots of long-term family friends around, to support our children as they go into puberty and must separate from us to some extent because we teach them how to be our child in our family and their developmental agenda is to learn how to be a person in a wider range of relationships. Today we're the only game in town and I really urge that all parents begin to anticipate with the onset of puberty changing their thinking about their child and no longer say, I've got to make this child what I've decided they will be, or else you can literally alienate them totally from you. And there aren't many adults left to pick up those kids. Teachers are the only ones left today for most kids that serve as an alternative to their peer group to socialize them in puberty. But tragically, the way we've organized middle school or junior high school is as soon as they start puberty and become very needy of this contact, we take them out of a primary relationship with a teacher they know and trust in a group they feel secure with in an educational model they're familiar with and make them part of a constantly rotating cluster of children that pass at least seven times a day past different teachers on a schedule determined by a bell that Pavlov used to produce anxiety and defeat the ability to learn in animals and this is supposed to be helpful for them and we're finding we're losing vast numbers of kids just through lack of contact and bonding because the parent senses the separation and unaware they don't have the backup systems of other adults to fill the gap, we tend to become more limiting, controlling, judgmental just at the time where we need to take a deep breath and say in my mind, it was never given that I would determine what this child's life will be. It was given that I would house them, feed them, and create an initial set of beliefs from which they would go on and discover themselves. I find it very helpful to say to, to parents, at about the age of 11, begin to see your child as a human being. Much like a very dear friend whose life you will never totally control, but who you would like to influence, but who you can also alienate if you get too heavy-handed with them. Today there are 1.3 million young people under the age of 18 whose parents have no idea where they are today. They're hanging out around malls, other places, because they got heavy-handed and they split on them. And so you have to leave that room. And listen to the difference in my objectivity when I say, my daughter's in a terrible jam, as opposed to Carrie has gotten herself into a difficult situation and I'm not sure how she's going to work her way out. 
Look at the difference in the respect and the objectivity that I can offer from that perspective. So I think it's very, very important that we recognize that, particularly with the onset of puberty, although we are in our heart quite responsible for supporting this young person, we must not make the illusion prominent in our thinking that I can and will control who they choose for friends, where they go, what they try, what they don't try, because otherwise we just set up that polarity. So I'm, and I'm very much behind, and in this context, I would suggest everyone that, that views this tape or that's here become a correspondent in the national effort to restructure what we call middle school today. Uh, the recent Carnegie Commission report, I think, was right on target when they said the most important issue for the early adolescent is bonding to positive role models who are more mature than they are. And it's a mistake to put them in very large uh, education factories at that point in time with too many in the same place. They recommended uh, going back to a middle school model with no more than about 200 young people of this age in any school at any time with a ratio of about 10 young people to adult to an adult and then at least four hours a day spent in working collaboratively with that same individual or team of individuals so the bonding can occur. There are about 16 states now that by law require this change to occur because we're learning that if you can get a child to the age of 16 still trusting a few adults in their life, you've got three-fourths of the, the battle of getting them into adulthood healthy uh, pretty much won. The National Center for the Study of Early Adolescence shows that a young person between the ages of the sixth grade and the ninth grade today who believes one member of the staff or faculty at the school they're currently attending knows them personally and cares for them is your least likely candidate for dropping out, delinquency, excessive peer influence, chemical abuse, all of those things. So that bonding is real important. Tragically, just as they start into this area and need the acceptance <coughs> of people who, even though they're struggling, still see past that to the fine, adequate person they're becoming and convey that message, what we tend to do is get into more limiting, controlling uh, interaction with them because we've got a lot to do and very little time to do it. So for some reason, whenever an adult sees himself as responsible for a child, we tend to slip into these behaviors. And I believe in another world, in a world where we lived in networks of extended family, where young people did play an active contributing role in most of the systems that touched their lives, where the on-the-job training for life didn't come from television and fantasy land, but from real exposure to the things that, that made life as they know it possible. And when parenting was done by all interested adults, rather than just by a part-time individual working real hard to survive and trying to have a little time left over to encourage the kids as it is today, uh, these behaviors that I'm about to show you that I will call barriers were probably no big deal. They were benign. But the world is full of things that became malignant in a different setting. I think there's a universal awareness that as long as the Exxon oil stayed in the Exxon tanker Valdez, it was relatively benign pla passing through Prince William Sound. As soon as it got out of the tanker, it became malignant, uh, and life is full of those kinds of things. So in a world without networks, meaningful roles for kids to play in our systems, without appropriate on-the-job training and an adequate base of parenting resources, <coughs> these are just too expensive uh, a set of behaviors to invest in. Okay, so for each of the barriers I'm about to show you, and as we walk along, this would be the way to look at it. For each of the barrier behaviors that I show you, if you come to recognize it for what it is, and when you're about to do it, just stop and do nothing instead, things will improve. Isn't that exciting? I'm about to show you how to be 500% more influential <laughs> in the next 24 hours by doing nothing conscientiously. Can you handle it? There's a little rule in business that says if you just don't run around creating liabilities for yourself, that could be profitable, okay? <laughs> so if you just don't run up a lot of debts, you'll be there. But then we'll take it a step further. For each of the barrier behaviors we've identified, we've gone on and found an appropriate builder that's easily substituted in the same situation by people who are a little more thoughtful and aware. So that with no more minutes and no more opportunities than you will have from now till you leave this planet anyway, I can show you how to be up to 1,000% more influential every single day, promoting closeness and trust, self-confidence, self-esteem, and affirming people's capabilities, significance, personal resourcefulness. Could you get into that? Yes. 
Okay, don't want to waste your time. <laughs> but there, there's a rule in business that also says it, anytime you can turn a, a liability into an asset, that's a 200% profit for you. And the beautiful part of all this is the incidents are going to happen anyway. The moments are already there. It's just seeing them as an opportunity to invest rather than just by default letting them go by in the same old way. I think that's really exciting. So let's take a little journey, and I'm going to get down to business here. Uh, <laughs> mother, wherever you are when you see this, okay, although I have now taken off my coat in a public place, I will still wear the tie for a little while so you can break <laughs> even. What that little message is, is my mom hates beards about as much as I hate coats and ties. She didn't hear what I just said earlier, and so she made it a point to make all of her kids shave. As a result of that, every living offspring of my mother today has a full beard if they're male. <laughs> and every daughter is married to a man with a full beard. <laughs> and this represents a declaration of independence <laughs> and, and illustrates that point early, that the harder you try to make them the way you determined they would be, the more compelled they are to face life on their own terms. So mom finally granted me amnesty after 19 years of never hugging me without first going like this. I sneaked up on her home about uh, two years ago on Mother's Day, and I was unannounced from out of state, and I got a cab to take me to the top of her street so that I could surprise her. And I started walking down the street, and I think she was looking out the window for bearded liberals, <laughs> uh, because she rushed out of the house, and when she saw me, ran up and threw her arms around me for the first time in 20 years, hugged me and kissed me without going like that. And I, I was really overwhelmed, and I said, Mom, what has precipitated this unprecedented display of unqualified positive regard? <laughs> and she said, don't give me that psychologist stuff. She said, I might have paid for it, but I don't have to listen to it on Mother's Day. <laughs> and I said, well, Mom, what caused you to just come right out and accept me like that without making a fuss? Dude, I look at it this way, son. You're 46 years old, and you haven't done time. <laughs> okay. And she says, as long as that remains true, I'm granting you amnesty. Besides, it's turning white, so it's less offensive, okay? <laughs> so I'm only going to ask one thing more, and since it's Mother's Day, I gr I'm asking that you grant one request. As long as you continue to uh, appear in public with that beard, always have a coat and tie in order to break even with the people that I know. <laughs> so if you see my mom, or mom, if you look in and see me, recognize I started out in good shape, but just as I did in life, as soon as I decided, I was more laid back than you wanted me to be. With that, <laughs> let me pass this along back here and if you can pass that up and out of the way maybe mom will come by and pick it up here at the <laughs> studio okay I'd like to to call this the 10 most powerful ways to affirm and validate people's capabilities and again in the language of relationships 90 percent of all we will ever communicate to people on this planet will come from our attitudes not our words so to say you can do it you know, I say to my children, as your mom said to you, honey, you can do anything if you try. And then when you start to try, I step in and say, now be careful. Uh, you know, watch it that way. Then my message of behavior is I don't trust you very much. Uh, out front, I'm conning you. That's that push-pull that we get into. And so it's real important that our behavioral messages that stem from our attitudes leave this, this message of credibility behind. Okay, and so I really want to look at behaving in ways that convey that message with or without words that you are a capable significant influential person so go down the list and you you can watch them as they they come up I'll try to to go first from the barrier then over to the builder and we'll do them as offsetting uh, factors all the way through now let's agree right off the top that none of you here in this room today would actually do one of these things <laughs> okay so we will all think of neighbors that we have who do poorly okay and think of ways we could help inspire them to do better all right most of these also come from expediency lack of awareness again a man named Massey years ago said who you are now is where you were when what he meant by that is many of the events in certain times of our developmental years left us with attitudes or impressions that surface as our behaviors he had to amend that later in his work to say who you are now is where you were when until you think about it and the moment you think about it and ask what are the impressions that caused me to do that and what would I have to believe to do it differently then you begin to shape your life rather than by default letting it be shaped so many of these occur traditionally expediently 
I had a lady who said to me recently when I went through this, well, my parents always did that with me, and I turned out okay. I didn't want to hurt her, but I said the problem with potential is who knows what might have been. <laughs> ah, you know, you may be getting by now, but who knows, you might have been this generation's Jonas Salk, <laughs> and you never went to medical school, you see, uh, because you weren't inspired to do that. And so who knows what the potential might have been, because I got by doesn't mean I thrive. And so I don't think about doing this bad, wrong, or good or right. I talk about more effective and less effective ways to get the message through. So if your desire is to say to people, when I say I love you and I care for you, my behavior won't cause you to doubt that. When I say you can take the risk to try and do things, nothing in my behavior would cause you to believe I might sell you out if you did it poorly the first round. So the first one, okay, we're busy, we're preoccupied, we have a lot to do, very little time to do it. Most of us spend less time in contact with those we love each 24 hours than any other generation of families have in history because even when we are home, we're usually watching three television sets concurrently. The average household in the United States operates three television sets concurrently, two on different stations in different parts of the house and one on Nintendo uh, VCR uh, linked to a computer somewhere. So we don't even watch the same things in the same place when we are there. And so in the midst of all of this, coming home after a busy day, burned out, frustrated and tired, lots to do, very little time to do it, the most tempting thing on earth is to be quick to begin to assume. That's the first barrier, is assuming. To assume what people will think, how they're going to feel, what they will say, how they will react, what I can and cannot rely on them to do. And then in second guessing them, act on that basis. And in the process, what am I saying? the highest I'm willing to allow you to grow in our relationship this moment is the weight of my past experience with you. But how many have you ever awakened wanting to be different with a whole plan to change today and then the old assumptions locked you into the same old boxes and at the end of the day you were there again? How many you observed in raising children that they reach thresholds and on one side of the threshold your assumption's right, he can't walk. Then he cuts loose, take this first little step, and now your new assumption is I can't catch him, <laughs> okay? Uh, she never said a word, so we say she can't talk. And then she breaks through and you can't shut her up, okay? And so we reach thresholds and we go along. And if we're open to that, we affirm and encourage people. How do you feel if I come to you and say, I didn't tell you about that because you always get upset? <laughs> what happens? Discouraged. You always get upset, don't you, yeah. for not being allowed to try for yourself? You were second guessed, and I voted no confidence in your ability to be any different than the same old inadequate person. I go home, my mother says, don't forget your coat. I forgot my coat when I was eight. Okay, she's convinced I've gained no increased competency in the intervening 40 years. Have you ever noticed how people regress toward a more childlike state when they're around their parents? Have you ever also noticed some of your feelings when your parents come into your home and somehow you feel less confident? inadequate there and we watch that happen people tend to regress around their parents toward more childlike states just because of those assumptions that are there between them I also talk to many many adults who say I have never enjoyed the relationship I wanted to with my parents because every time they come into my life they're directing correcting somehow I just feel less in control of things recently had a poem written by an adult child of an alcoholic who said mom why couldn't you have seen me as my friends and family saw me. An interesting, resourceful woman with her own unique ideas and ways of doing things. But every time you came into my life, you preempted me, took control, directed me, put me down for my ways of doing things, so I didn't let you in very often. And now you've died, and we will never know each other as the people we really were. Very sad. I often think about what would Helen Keller's life have been like had not Anna come along and stopped her parents from operating on their assumptions about what a deaf and blind child could or could not experience. She would have finished life, relatively speaking, a vegetable compared to what she became. But, in, but instead of assuming, Anna challenged the family to check it out creatively, which is the alternative. Every assumption that you operate on replaces a chance to creatively check out or test whether there's new potential there or not. So she challenged the family to do it differently, find out instead of assuming. And what happened? She emerged into life a woman with eyes that couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear. 
but one of the most contagious visions of the turn of the century, that in spite of all that I am a capable person with significant things to offer, who in spite of my handicaps will decide what my life is rather than letting the handicaps decide it, and she inspired a whole world. Think of the millions, though, of young Americans going into puberty this year with eyes that see and ears that hear, but no clear vision that they are capable, significant, influential people. And for lack of that vision, as the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And for lack of that vision, they're easily diverted into activities that compromise them, that throw away their lives. And this is a real important investment. Probably the most painful single piece of research that I've looked through in terms of its implications were the results of an experiment in which a plastic surgeon operated on Down syndrome children, pulling in their outstanding ears, altering their epicanthic folds to normal, trimming their tongues to fit within their mouths. That's all that was done as he changed their appearance, but that changed people's assumptions. And within two years, the typical child who'd received the surgery showed over 40% increase in self-confidence, initiative, assertiveness, IQ, achievement, happiness, every scale that measured life satisfaction, social integration, been enhanced by over a third. And then think of the millions of little children whose appearance makes it so convenient for people to assume away one third of their joy, their satisfaction, their productivity. Think of the assumptions in school that, sa that say, because this child doesn't do the work the way others do, they're somehow not so good. So we send home Edison, Einstein, Rockefeller, Bruce Jenner, Greg Louganis as dumb, stupid, inadequate people. And then later people who don't assume they learn like everybody else does, but, but check out how they learn. Have them inventing things, uh, writing the theory of relativity, winning Olympic events, all those kinds of things. So we have to be very, very careful with this. So one thing all this did for me was make me a very repentant <laughs> assumer. And I awaken each morning now, and as part of my meditations, I say, God, please help me be sensitive to the assumptions that I lay on other people today that could limit them and frustrate them in what we try to do. Whenever I become aware I'm about to operate on one, then I ask the question, what would happen if I didn't use this assumption now? And the answer comes back, I would find out. And isn't it better to find out and encourage what could be than to assume and vote no confidence? Now the do-nothing option. Let's suppose my mother, next time I'm home, seeing me walk toward the door on a cold night with no jacket, could just find it within her to stand there and say nothing. Knowing me, I would probably get to the door and say, aren't you going to remind me again about my coat? <laughs> she could then say, no, dear, I've decided if it's important to you, you'll deal with it. And I'd say, then I better take care of it, because it could be cold out there. And she will say, far out, my baby may make it on his own <laughs> after all these years. We could have gone all the way to the other side, and we could have said, I know this has upset you before, but I thought I'd better check this out with you. Now how would you feel? Would you feel I respected you? Mm -hmm. Would you feel I had confidence in your ability to put things together? Okay. Anna came along and said, instead of assuming Helen can do this, what creative test can we think of to explore where she's going? My mother could have said to me, Steve, what will you need to have ready for your trip today? And she didn't hear what she wanted. She didn't have to say, don't forget your coat. She could say, what about the weather there in Anchorage, Alaska? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it might be chill. I, I may need a coat or jacket. She'll say, far out, he's getting it. <laughs> but the very fact that she at checked out my plans and checked out my awareness of things, rather than assuming I couldn't and taking control, says to me, my mom respects me. Maybe I can open up more and more of my thoughts to her and we can get along with respect. So that should be number one. Do you have a little handle on that? What are you going to do next time you become aware that you're about to say, well, they'll think? What are you going to do? What are the words going to come out of your mouth? <laughs> you're going to do nothing. That's a good start, okay? I just wanted to check it out with you. Okay, let me check this out with you or... I'm not sure how you'll feel about this, so I thought I'd better check it out with you. Then we're moving along. So help your neighbors with that one. Okay, now the next one, okay? This is one none of you here would do, but think of your neighbors who do it. I call this rescuing slash explaining. And let me point out that rescue when I've extended myself beyond my means and need it is one of the greatest gifts we have to give. But to step in prematurely and rescue me from chances to experience my resourcefulness and gain validation. It's a vote of no confidence. 
in my ability. And in a world where our children have to become more clear and aggressive intellectually, to step in prematurely and explain the significance of something for me, instead of challenging me to think it through and discover insight, wipes out that moment of mastery and empowerment. It's fine to, to explain to me things that I wouldn't know otherwise. Let me explain these ideas to you that I have. These are some instructions we got. That's fine. But when I've had an experience or when I'm facing a problem, instead of stepping in and say, this is the problem, this is why it's a problem, this is what you do to fix it, which says, shut up, dummy, let somebody else organize things for you and be such a mess in the first place. Instead of doing that, say, I'd like to challenge you to have a look at that and see what initial ideas you can come up with for dealing with that and then work with me on that. <coughs> and this is a very, very powerful process. When I step in and provide the what, the why, and the how to deal with a situation based on my vast repertoire of experience, or I provide the insight by <laughs> explaining it for you, in both cases I'm voting no confidence in your ability to learn through experience and no confidence in your ability to think, and that will undercut that whole process. Uh, I think of something for me very, very important, and that is that I'm really afraid that many of this generation's truly gifted individuals, the Salks and Churchills and others, are dying a premature intellectual death because of multiple choice, true and false, fill in the blanks, lockstep education, and the tendency of adults generally as their parents and teachers to think for them rather than to challenge them. And as we face issues like AIDS and so on coming up, we need all the creative thinkers that we can come up with to pull this together. I remember, though, another virus. How many of you remember when polio was way beyond the level that AIDS is at the present time as a threat to us? I remember having to give up our pets, being unable to go swimming in public pools. Uh, we were guarding against everything because we didn't know where it was going to come from. In fact, I can remember that in my family of origin, I am the only child of my mother that escaped childhood without infantile paralysis. I remember going upstairs one night as a little boy. I must have been about 11 years of age. Of course, my, my memories of this are just my memories of it. But I remember going upstairs to see what the ambulance was about and seeing my sister go by on a stretcher, drawn back like the letter C with her spinal paralysis, and at age 10 saying goodbye to dating, dancing, motherhood, all of those wonderful things. Behind her was my little brother, three years of age, heavily stricken with it, probably to the point of paralysis of the lungs, and very few kids uh, live very long in those iron lungs that they were off to, to put them in, and so things looked really bleak, and I remember hearing my mom in tears and the doctor, you know, trying to be fair about all this, you know, the little one, uh, you know, we may not be able to do a whole lot with at his age and his condition, and that was happening to many, many millions of people. And just when it looked that bleak, Jonas Salk made his breakthrough. And I'll always be grateful it came at that time because they were able to reduce the severity of many of the existing cases and prevent it from occurring anymore. And I recently talked at a high school, and I asked the young people, how many of you know who Jonas Salk is? And very few raised their hand. I said, how many of you know what this high school auditorium would have looked like if he hadn't grown up to believe he was a capable person who could take the initiative to learn and challenge the world? then one-third of the space in this auditorium today would have been reserved for wheelchair parking, and it would have been a whole group of attendants at the back to put your crutches and walkers up there while you attended this meeting, and that's where it would have been. One-third of you listening to me right now would have been crippled or in some way impaired because of that uh, had not this person discovered that he was a capable, significant, influential person who could challenge our world effectively and this actually came at the right moment so that my brother and sister have lived basically uh, normal, healthy lives, as has everyone else since that time. My father may have started me on my life's work, though, at that time when he said, we've just been touched by the work of a great person. And he said, most people will study what it was Dr. Salk accomplished. The wise people will study what went into Dr. Salk to prepare him to accomplish that because they realize that I may never have a chance to confront polio anymore because he did that. But if I know what he knows about becoming the best he can be, I can do what I do better. And so he said, you always study superior people to find out what prepared them to be that way and then pass it on if you can. So I became a very inveterate <laughs> salt watcher. And I'll never forget uh, one day when it was clear this was a major breakthrough of earth-shaking proportions, a newspaper reporter came up to Dr. Salk and he said, Dr. Salk, 
How does this incredible success that has virtually given us the tools to one day drive polio from the planet Earth cause you to look back on your previous 200 failures? Never forget what he said. He turned and said, I do not understand the concept of failure. I have never encountered it in any circumstance in my life. He said, I was not raised to see success or failure, win or lose, problems, hassles, mistakes. I was only raised to see challenges, situations, opportunities, and discovery. He said, in essence, and I hope I, I paraphrase the little story right, in essence, when I was about three and, and dropped a jug of milk, my mother was not the kind of mother who would say, why can't you ever, how come you never, surely you realize, how many times do I have to tell you when you ever grow up? You know better than that. Look at the mess. You should be ashamed. What will we do for dinner? Okay. Instead, she loved me more than she loved 31 cents worth of milk. And she recognized this was probably a noble attempt on my part to show initiative and take care of myself. It was only hampered by coordination and judgment that I didn't quite have. But you shouldn't have had a child unless you're willing to allow for differences in coordination and judgment and look at what went right with it. What were they trying to do? Maybe he was being thoughtful and didn't want to disturb you. So he went to take care of one of his own needs. How many of you will later encourage kids to take care of their own needs and become more resourceful and so on? And so she said instead, why, if why can't you ever, how come you never? Jonas, now that jug is empty. I'm sure if you study it, you can find some better ways to hang on to it. <laughs> okay, and then realizing my attention span was short, she was the kind of mother who would encourage me to sit right down in the milk and conduct my research right away so I wouldn't lose it. <laughs> I would rise from the milk uh, with what was clearly a superior grip on the jug, like Phoenix from the Ashes, after a little experimentation. I got it. Look, Mom, I can hold it. She would say, I know you can, my son. I knew you could find a better way. And now that you've found a better grip on the jug, what can you think of to help me straighten up the mess your first experiment has caused? <laughs> she could have said, run over there and fetch the mop, you mindless little object. But instead, she said, join me and offer another thoughtful contribution, you little asset. <laughs> And he said that, uh, you know, those kinds of experiences taught me at the ripe old age of three that if I was thoughtful and asked of myself only three questions in every experience, what happened, what caused that to happen, and how can I benefit from that experience, how is that insight useful, there is nothing on this earth I couldn't ultimately confront if I would try and evaluate. Henry Ford once said, most people <coughs> will never be successful because they've been taught to think in terms of success and failure. They started out confident, assertive, resourceful human beings as children. They were willing to learn. They weren't closed and arrogant. They were willing to take the risk to try new things. They knew no guilt, no shame, no self-consciousness. And you have to beat this out of them quickly in childhood so that you can sell it back to them at midlife as assertiveness training or therapy. <laughs> and so we found most of us will be so intimidated over trying. Do it right or don't do it at all. Why can't you ever? How come you never surely realize how many times I have to tell you? that by the time we're 14, 15, 16, all that marvelous creativity that would have allowed us to own our universe has turn, turned into intimidation and fright, and it spilled over into, I won't try anything, I'm not sure I can do all right, because I might embarrass myself and somebody would look down on me, and we've beaten that out of them. I'm personally real excited about the T-shirts the that we, we have this year. One of our favorite is mistakes, our wonderful opportunities to learn. And if we could just teach a whole generation that, America could once again lead the world in productivity, creativity, achievement. On our t-shirts, all the words are misspelled, so it means it's not done right. But the message still gets through, and it gets through better because it wasn't done right. Uh, and I think if we convey that message, we could give our kids a tremendous leg up. And that's what Jonas Salk was teaching us. Winston Churchill was once asked, what in your school experience best prepared you to lead Britain out of her darkest hour when you challenged a whole nation about to give in to the Nazis as France had done rather than in go on enduring the bomb shelters. And you rose up, challenged them, straightened their spines, turned the tide of World War II. What prepared you to do that? And he was thoughtful, and I'll paraphrase his answer. He said, it was the two years I spent in the seventh grade. And the reporter said, did you fail? He said, obviously not. I had two opportunities to learn how to do it effectively. <laughs> okay, he said what Britain needed was not brilliance, but the will to thoughtfully improve on an initial attempt that appeared to go poorly. <laughs> and I learned that in childhood. I gave it back at midlife to my people when they needed it. 
Other times he sat on the dais at a large gathering, obviously inebriated. A wealthy British woman leaned over and said, Why, Sir Winston, you're drunk. And he said, And madam, you are ugly. He <laughs> said, But I shall be sober in the morning, and you shall still be ugly. Okay? <laughs> So remember that all great change comes at the hands of optimists rather than pessimists. Okay, Henry Ford said, only those people who learn try and demand insight, try and demand insight, will ultimately earn their way into lasting success. So we have to encourage kids to see it that way. So when you explore the what, the why, and the how with me, what happened, what caused that to happen, how can you benefit from that in the future? Take your best shot and let's evaluate it. Then it's a tremendous vote of confidence, okay? One more personal thing. How do you feel at work? Those of you that, that on a regular basis work outside of your home. Uh, I never say work versus be at home because home can be just as much work. But where you have a supervisor over you, how do you feel when you go to them with a problem? And instead of exploring your ideas for solving it, they just push you aside and take over. How do you feel? Are they a person that you seek out later? Do you soon start to withhold the information they need to do their job right because the way they react makes you feel less? Do you look for other jobs? There are a lot of us that are real good managers and then we don't apply any of those concepts to the people we live with. There are people who teach in the classroom very effectively and then at home threaten, correct, direct, and expect, totally intimidate their children. Because if they could just see these are all human beings, and if I could just see m these young people not as my children, but as children that I'm teaching, I could make that shift fine. If a fine manager could just say, if, if the family was a corporation and my partner was another executive vice president with a different area of responsibility and we were committed to team management, how would we approach each other? If this son or daughter was our finest technical asset for the future, one of our best supervisors, but had this problem, how would we approach them to get it resolved? Wouldn't we have it together? And so I think there's some wonderful opportunities there. Let's go to the most disgusting on the list. <coughs> <laughs> and we know no one here would do this. Let's take a pact in blood. Up to now, you should be replacing assuming with checking and rescuing and explaining with challenging and exploring. Okay, and exploring is the key word. Explore the what, the why, and the how, which assumes let me encounter it, if it won't hurt me, and then explore the what, the why, and the how. The next one is probably the most disgusting of all and probably costs us the most and is the most seductive to slip into. This is the behavior we call directing. Okay, how many of you have ever heard a neighbor going like this with their family? Pick that up, put that away, it's time for your shower now, be sure and get over here and have some milk before the bus comes. <laughs> Straighten up these chairs before the bell rings. Put these books away before the end of the class. Hand this in at the office as you go down the hallway. How many of you know somebody that does that? a neighbor or someone. What this is saying is I see you as no more capable or significant than a German shepherd, but not nearly as well trained or obedient. If you are more like a dog and less like a person, both of our lives would go so much more smoothly. <laughs> and then my neighbor who treats his children like dogs, buys an expensive puppy and spends 10 weeks at obedience school learning to communicate effectively with his dog so he won't deny it its potential. And then his wife and children had far more potential but required more dignity and respect in the communication, reduces them to the level of animals, and so they reciprocate by acting like it. Because not an hour goes by that you don't hear. I told you to pick up these shoes and you left the socks. And they say, you didn't say socks, okay? <laughs> Try this yourself, go home tonight <coughs> and find someone in your family that you love whose shoes and socks are in your living room. And in the expediency of everyday life, just say, put your shoes away before dinner. Come back in five minutes, what will have happened? Generally nothing. But if the shoes are gone, the socks you didn't mention will be left there. And you'll find yourself saying, I told you to take the shoes and you left the socks, and they'll say? <laughs> okay, and then what will be your assumption? I have to tell them everything. Okay, not realizing the more you tell them, the more you have to tell them, because you're teaching passive-aggressive behavior. Whenever you start to direct another human being, you take away their need to feel potent and in control of their life and affirmed as significant in contributing something to you. So they reciprocate by doing the least possible down to the letter minus one part to bug you. And then they will generally <laughs> ignore you several times yeah. until you feel as impotent and insignificant as they do. That's their way of getting even. But now if you want to try another experiment, a week from now when you have friends coming by, 
and you find one of those nights where their Legos are all over your living room, their Nintendo's wired into your communal TV, their skateboard's leaning against your couch, their book bag is on your recliner. Have you seen your neighbor's house look like that? Okay. <laughs> Take them aside and just say, listen, honey, I've got some friends coming by in a little while. I'm trying to get some refreshments ready. If you could take responsibility for the living room for me, it would help out a great deal, and I'd surely appreciate it. And that's all you said. What will generally happen in the majority of cases? Will they pick up the Legos without being told? Will they put away the Nintendo? Will they get rid of that skateboard somewhere magically in the house? Drag their book bags into their room? How many of them will also straighten up magazines and arrange cushions that you didn't think of? And how many of them will come later and say, is there anything else I can do to help you get ready? A fair number, won't they? What was the difference? When you invited or encouraged my assistance rather than directing my compliance, you empowered me as significant in your life and in the relationship. So when you invite or encourage me to work with you to solve problems and make contributions, you empower me. The teacher that will say, we're almost at the end of this class. Anything any of you could do to help me straighten up, I'd sure appreciate it. We'll find that not all kids will help initially because some are alienated and believe this is a trick. <laughs> okay, but those who do will give you a much more conscientious effort, where the other way they'll always leave a few chairs crooked, a few books back there to bug you, step right over the trash that you didn't mention, while on the other system you'll get a much different result coming out of it. The worst area, and I need to say this, the worst area for using this behavior is if you use it with the person you marry or live with. Okay, very high warning. How many of you know a couple in your experience? <laughs> <laughs> where one member of that couple routinely is telling the other one things like, don't forget your dentist appointment, be sure and drop the, the car off, be back at five, remember the Joneses are coming by. How many of you know someone that does that? Okay, I'm going to tell this to you and you won't like it. But once this becomes a pattern between those two people living together, the one who is on the receiving end of this direction most will immediately begin to seek outside relationships, immediately just as surely as the sun comes up. You can't prevent it. What they're looking for is their dignity and their self-respect, although they give up most of it to find it. If those relationships are not sexual in nature, they will find more and more excuses to stay at work longer hours. They will begin to develop a whole array of friends and outside interests that don't involve you. Soon you'll even be looking at separate vacations, separate automobiles, separate checking accounts. What are they saying in their quiet, passive-aggressive way? I feel so diminished by your presence that I'm going to use every strategy I can think of to minimize my contact with you. And that's tragic. And if you don't turn that around, you're going to lose it. You didn't treat each other that way when you were courting or hustling. You treat each other as resourceful people with great respect. It was later that one got on top of the other in that power position. I recently had an experience like that. Where, and, and these are the two, I give you two little test questions. Whenever you're about to use directing as a way of getting something done, ask the first question. Are the consequences of me not taking total control of this moment so unacceptable that I can justify alienating this person further, reducing their desire to cooperate with me, undercutting the integrity of this relationship? How often in a week will you get a yes answer to that? Very, very rarely. That would suggest that directing should be your last, most disgusting option rather than the most convenient knee-jerk response at the end of the day to getting things done. Okay, recently, Tricia, okay, the person that I've spent the last 23 years with, said to me, don't forget to pick up Michael after school. And immediately there surged up within me the sense of resentment. Because, see, I can drive all the way through Connecticut at rush hour turn in my national rental car on time, get to LaGuardia Airport, catch all the right flights, check in my bags, remember where I parked my car a week ago, <laughs> have enough money to bail it out, but I can't remember my own son, you see. And so that was my initial response. But then I thought, what are the consequences of me forgetting Michael? And those were unacceptable from her point of view, too. So asking that question, I gave her amnesty. However, I would have certainly appreciated being told instead, Steve, what are your plans for getting Michael this afternoon? That would have sound, sounded like an equally responsible person. Uh, it would have been a nice way to check out what I was planning to do. But I gave amnesty on that one and went ahead. However, she also said, don't forget to wash your car today. And I enjoyed driving it dirty for three days 
until she forgot about it and I did it my way. That's the nature of people. So whenever the answer is no, the consequences don't justify it, ask the second question. Is there any possibility this human being will ever have to develop plans of their own during their lifetime? Okay, because how do I learn to plan something if you always plan it and tell me what to do? How do I learn to deal with holes in my plans if you never encourage me to try one in the first place and test it out? Okay, so we never stand taller with those we love than when we do things like this. We have a problem getting the chores done. Let's have a family meeting and discuss people's ideas for taking care of this. And then once we make a commitment, decide who will do what to take care of it. Okay, uh, I have a problem for after work tomorrow, and I need to discuss with you, you know, how we can take care of that as a family because it will affect all of us. Doesn't that suggest more dignity and respect and belief in their power? So we invite or encourage my assistants. Ultimately, what's wrong with saying to a son or daughter, what we need to have ready for your field trip on the weekend? And you listen carefully. There are some holes, but none of them are that big a deal. Why not let them run with it and experiment? Sounds good to me. Hope you have a great time. And off they go for the weekend with no food and no jacket, okay? <laughs> it's a short weekend. It's like 48 hours. When they get home, you can have a little dialogue. You can say, uh, what happened this weekend? I was hungry. Uh, what do you believe caused that? So how do you see yourself handling your next field trip differently as a result of this? Okay, sounds good to me. I knew you could handle it, son. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Okay, what's wrong with that? Okay, let's drop to number four. How many of you heard people say don't expect too much of the people you love? How many of you believe that? How many of you also heard, though, that those we love will find in our eyes the mirrors in which they will discover themselves? <coughs> How many of you heard that? Well, if I don't reflect the best possible reflections of what you're capable of being as a person, how will you find it? Some of you are of a Judeo-Christian orientation. Does God suggest high expectations for the children of God in those traditions? All things are possible to them that believe. If you had the faith of a grain of mustard, you'd move mountains around conveniently. That's fairly heavy duty. Okay, so I believe we should always have the highest possible expectations of those we love, that there's nothing in their life ultimately that they are not capable of gaining mastery over. But although we should have the highest possible expectations, we should avoid the barrier of expecting. Now, does that sound like a contradiction? And it could. And here's the difference. I have the highest possible expectations, but I must avoid using your potential as the standard by which I judge your current performance and then pointing out your deficiency with words like, I was expecting more maturity than that. I was expecting more thoughtfulness than that. I was expecting a better job than that. You with me? Yeah, look at how we do that. Okay, uh, any clergy person in your town who sets perfection as a standard and then uses the meetings to dwell on the failure of the members to achieve it will only have a shrinking core of masochists for a congregation. Okay, the clergy person that sets perfection as a goal and publicly celebrates in each meeting anybody's movement toward it, however small, so people can come away saying, I'm not where I'm going, but I'm not where I was either. And every time I make a step on the road, that's cause for celebration. We'll have a growing, contagious, discovering, high energy, magnetic group of people there discovering the best they can be. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we talk about serenity in one day at a time. God grant me the serenity to accept that which I cannot change, which is yesterday, today, not yesterday, tomorrow, and the rest of my life. Give me the courage to change that which I can, which is today and this moment of my life, and then the lifelong wisdom to know the difference. And any day that I've made a step by choice toward what I've chosen to be, that's cause for a great celebration. And I think that's important to recognize. Remember this little principle with people. It is easier to tame a fanatic than to put life into a corpse. Okay, I love that. When you expect too much too soon, you tend to get corpses. Uh, but when you're quick to celebrate any little movement in the right direction, you tend to inspire more. You ever seen your neighbor come home and ignore the clean cupboard, ignore the dishes in the sink, and go right to the trash that was left behind and follow up with a bizarre comment like, I was expecting this kitchen clean? After the third time, if their child has any moral integrity, they will say, I'm not going to fool around doing anything anymore because they always take for granted what I take the time to do and then really get bent out of shape about what I overlook, and I can't think of it all, so why bother at all? Fourth time you do that, they will say, I'm going to learn to ignore that person totally. That way when they get home and see I did nothing, they run around and do most of it while they're yelling about it. But I'm learning to ignore them, so the yelling doesn't matter either, and I'm home free. <laughs> then you have those awful places your neighbors live in where people yell and ignore, yell and ignore. The other error is timing. I appreciate the clean cupboard and the dishes in the sink, but have you noticed that? 
Americans are horribly fixated on butts as a culture. <laughs> and everywhere we go, we remain, constant alert, remain constantly alert for them. And whenever we suspect one, we forget everything else that goes on around it. There was even a guy in management that used to run around saying, always tell people something nice before you cut their legs off. <laughs> okay, and that just made people suspicious. When you like something, they wonder where, when it's going to hit. Really, if you would just say, I appreciate the effort that you put in, in the kitchen. It's obvious. Thank you. And leave it right there. An hour later, when you're doing dinner or something, if you could take the time to remove this trash for me, dear, it would help me. Now that I'm getting dinner ready, the kid would say, far out. Even if you don't get it all, they sure get off on what you do do. So it's worth your time and effort to keep trying. Uh, and that way, it's a second contribution when you invite my insistence with the other. Just one quick test. Is it possible that children see kitchens differently than parents? <laughs> <laughs> okay. To us, our kitchens are frequently the center of our universe. To them, they're clearly pit stops on the road to immortality. <laughs> From that perspective, you invest differently. And my daughter may have said it well when she said, Dad, I've noticed when you're doing chores and something more interesting to you comes along, you let the chore sit. I'm not going to tell Mom, but I did notice on Saturday uh, that when Mrs. What's-Her-Name came by in her bikini and her daughter's convertible, you let the uh, lawnmower run out of gas in the middle of the front lawn, <laughs> dealing with that. She said, well, I was doing the kitchen. I turned to pick up the trash, and a 19-year-old hunk and a firebird pulled up outside, and I had to decide which trash to go for. <laughs> and I obviously went for the one you like least, but I'm on my way. So when you're quick to celebrate any little movement in the right direction, look what was done, what was risked, what was accomplished, rather than what's left to go. Be quick to celebrate that. Then you tend to inspire more and more in that direction. Fourteen years ago now, when my daughter, who just turned 18 and graduated from high school, was four years old, she rushed up to her mother and myself one evening and said, Mom, Dad, how come I don't get a night to do dishes like the older kids? <laughs> now see, what kind of an idiot would throw cold water on that? <laughs> but think how often we do with bizarre comments like, you too little, you won't do it carefully, so on. And when they're old enough to do it carefully, they're too smart to believe it's still important, <laughs> and now you have a corpse on your hands, okay? We'd ruined it with the first two, and so we saw a chance to recover here. And so instead of those negative approaches we had used, we now said, did you want Thursday or Friday? She said, I'll take Thursday. We said, you got it. <laughs> okay, Thursday night came. We got out the plastic dishes. That was our job, okay? <laughs> came to the end of dinner, and she said, okay, you kids get out of here now. Everybody get out of the kitchen. I'll show you I can handle it. I can do dishes as well as anyone in this family. What did she want? the status and recognition of doing important things. Now just a couple of little things here. I have found that when adults have their night to do the dishes too, kids view their night more as a contribution than a chore that kids are stuck with. I also find we very frequently get up in the morning thinking of all these chores and we go to our kids and we say, okay, do this, this, and this after school. We don't think to say, well, what are your plans for after school tonight, dear? because there are a couple of things that I need done also, and we need to work out a way to get them done. You would have less resistance, and they would view you as more respectful if you believed that they had an agenda too that had some legitimacy. And so and I recently had one of those events. See, my family has always left Saturday night as my night to do the dishes. That way, after traveling all week, I have a choice. I can either take them out to dinner <laughs> and not do the dishes, or I can stay home and do the dishes. That's my choice. But I recently made a bad call and decided to eat at home. And so, you know, dinner was over, and I was sitting for a few minutes before getting up to do the dishes. And my daughter came up behind me and reached down, grabbed my beard with her hands, and tipped my head up and kissed me on the top of the head. Now, not everybody can appreciate this experience, but those who are equipped, <laughs> you, you may never <laughs> come to appreciate this. You may or may not, okay, but hang in. Uh, the rest of you probably won't. I think you're committed. Uh, but for those of us who are equipped, this is a very sensitive area for emotional experiences, particularly when daughters want to hug daddies and kiss them on the top of their head. So she kissed me on the top head and said, Daddy, you've worked so hard for us this week. Why don't you let me do the dishes for you tonight while you chill out? Okay, now see, it couldn't have been a contribution if I hadn't had the role of doing it but now she could do that for me as a, as a trade-off. I think those are nice messages. So this particular night, inspired with her opportunity at validation, she drug the stool up and went for it. The quantity of effort was fanatical. Okay, it took years for the quality to catch up. 
but by then she was totally hooked. This particular night, she ran out of dishes long before she ran out of enthusiasm and inspiration. And so looking around for a further target, she took the same soapy, greasy rag and proceeded to the front of the stove, the refrigerator, the sliding glass doors out onto the patio, <laughs> turned down the hallway. Uh, we just caught her heading for the living room <laughs> and said with enormous sincerity, no one has ever invested this much effort in doing the dishes. She said, I knew it. I'm the best of all. I can handle it. I showed them. Then we got her into bed and spent an hour with Windex and paper towels discussing the wisdom of this empowerment. But I can tell you this, if you were to drop by our house right now and she was coming home and there was any clutter around in the kitchen or elsewhere, she would stop and tidy it up before going to her room. She's not a slow learner. This was just a contribution she made when she wanted to. It's been treated as one ever since, so she does it to make her home a less stressful place to be. On the other hand, some years ago in my sickness and responsibility as a firstborn family hero, uh, raised in a family where you didn't say two words, I feel. <laughs> or I want. You see, you always felt what you were supposed to feel, and you always wanted only that which you could justify as needing. Uh, so you didn't do things for yourself. You always did them for others, and that's the basic message. And so caught up in that thinking, I decided that even though I love playing golf, playing golf when no one in the family plays golf, and you've been away traveling and your hours are, are few, is a very selfish act, and so I gave it up because I didn't view looking after myself as a top priority you're supposed to sacrifice. On the other hand, my neighbor, who has about 10 hours a week to be with his family, always spends six hours of that 10 hours on the golf course. And so his little son decided, if I'm ever to know my father, I'd better take up golf. Thank goodness he recruited my son in his venture. And the first time you know you're in trouble is when you come home and find your golf stuff laying around on the lawn. And as I said, I was raised by a man who would have faced this disarray of his things with hostility, aggression, and would have uh, sanctioned us heavily, uh, always saying to his children, if you can't put it away, never touch it again, not realizing the attempts to pick it up was an attempt on the part of kids to be like him. He encouraged us not to in any way want to be like him. Uh, and so that was my initial impression, kind of the Neanderthal instinctual response, I'll kill it. Okay, <laughs> but I've had the opportunity of spending the last 23 years of my life with a woman who's taught me to think childishly uh, by both her example and her encouragement. <laughs> okay, uh, meaning by that in the best possible way, always spontaneously see it from the child's point of view through their eyes. And so as the Neanderthal came up in, in me and suggested mayhem, uh, the new me said, what was going on in your son's mind? He's interested in golf. If you can encourage this interest, you might have a little buddy to play golf with. <laughs> okay, that's more pregnant with possibilities, isn't it? So I finally went to him and I said, what else can I do to help you disturb my stuff? <laughs> okay. Then I went over and held a summit conference with my neighbor. And in self-defense, since his golf stuff was being drug around too, Christmas was upon us, so we decided we'd buy starter sets for the boys, their own little clubs. So we bought them. On Christmas Day, bestowed them upon our offspring. Two days after Christmas, needing exercise, we went out to the golf course and got golf carts to ride around on. <laughs> okay. Uh, as a result of this decision, my neighbor and his son pulled up to the tee ahead of Michael and myself. And remember, this is the first time either boy has seen this citadel of higher spiritual awareness <laughs> that their fathers called a golf course. And I'm absolutely sure that in at least the mind of my neighbor's son, he said, I'm about to get closer to God than through any other experience on earth because my dad obviously prefers being here on Sunday to being in church. Okay, <laughs> follow me through that? So in his excitement and enthusiasm, he reached back and he grabbed a club at random out of his arsenal because what the heck, they're just clubs, right? Okay, he went to leap off the cart and his dad intercepted him, took the club away, put it back in the uh, bag, took the driver out, put it in his chest and said, okay, pay attention, this is the one you use here, not that one. Kid still had some enthusiasm left, so he leaped off the cart, began to swing his club. His dad said, get over here. Get your butt down, get your knees in, get your head down, <laughs> get your grip right. By the time the kid was finished, you could see him. He was reeling in shock and confusion. Uh, he staggered his way over to the cart, uh, climbed on. On the next hole, he was so in a fog trying to remember all this stuff that he inadvertently grabbed the wrong club again. His father chose that moment to say, listen, that's the wrong club again. You either pay attention, do it right, 
or don't do it at all. And that's all he needed. He became catatonic, subsided like a lump on the edge of the golf cart seat, has never touched a golf club since, never expressed the slightest interest in going. By demanding too much too soon, his father got a corpse, who probably will never again risk playing golf until his father's left this planet and he can do it with dignity. On the other hand, knowing a little more about kids, I recognized this was a celebration for Mike. And so he grabbed a club at random out of his arsenal, because who the heck cares at this age? It's a club. He leaped off the cart and began to chase butterflies, <laughs> ruin people's tee shots. He tried several strategies to get his ball. Finally came to me, Dad, how do I get this from here to there? I said, son, that is the question of the ages. Okay. But I said, in your case, what we'd better do is ride down. When we get close to the hole, you can throw it, and we'll call that one. Okay, and then you can chase it with your clubs till it goes in the hole. Okay, as a result, I have this totally inspired little golf buddy that I've spent uh, some of the best four hours a week for the last two years imaginable, particularly as he starts into puberty, and this is a special time for us to do our thing together. But it's never easy. You will always pay your dues for any risks you take with kids. In this particular case, my birthday occurs on January 7th. Seeing my rekindled interest in golf at Christmas, the family logically decide to celebrate my birthday by bestowing upon me two dozen top flight XLs, the longest ball. January 8th, I returned to my home and found the boxes and wrappers that the balls had come in, sitting on the edge of the pond in the middle of our farm. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I always believe that when you have feelings toward those that you love, you should express them right away. <laughs> okay, but listen very carefully. Although you should express them right away, try not to involve them in it. See, that's the mistake. We go to those we love most and say all the dumb things that are going on. If we loved them, we would go somewhere where they couldn't possibly find us and then <laughs> say it all. When your kid is an hour late getting home at night and you're close to apoplexy, say it all. I'll kill them. They're grounded forever. They'll never breathe another uncluttered <laughs> breath. Get it all out of the way so you don't look foolish when they get home waiting through all that garbage. So, okay, so I had terrible feelings too, okay? And they, they contained a lot of mayhem initially. Uh, and so I went up the driveway and went over in front of my neighbor's house till I was clearly both out of eyesight and earshot. And then I said it in a wonderfully cathartic moment that made me feel healthy and still left room for my dignity and respect to go home. <laughs> Okay? I work, I slave, I should have had a vasectomy. <laughs> you, you know how you, how you get when this stuff goes on. And when I was finally breathing normally, I said, now how would I handle this in my workshop? <laughs> okay, and you'll never guess how I did it. I went back down the road. I said, Michael, let me be sure I understand the significance <laughs> of these wrappers and boxes over here. What's your perception of what's been going on today? He said, Dad, I was so embarrassed holding you up on the tee when we tried to play golf because I wasn't good at tee shots. I decided while you were gone this week, I would practice so we could have a better round on the weekend. And he said, the worst hole is the one with all that water in front of it. <laughs> so I figured I might as well face the worst thing first. And he said, and look what I've done. And before I could stop him, he bent down with a ball and tee, put it down, whop, right over the pond. He said, the last two have done that. <laughs> okay, the last two. Now, you've got to be an optimist with kids. Uh, and so I said, son, as a reward for your initiative, I'm getting you a snorkel. <laughs> okay. We went out to the golf course on Saturday. We came up on the par three with water. I put down my ball and tee, addressed the shot properly, whop, right in the pond. Okay. He came up, put his down, whop, right on the green. As we went to get on the golf cart, he reached out supportively offering me empathy and moral support, put his arm around me in encouragement and said, Dad, when I get my snorkel, we can share it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you think he would have felt that way about me if I'd beat the heck out of him for trying to do better and make my golf day better? Wasn't that highly noble of that little kid to take the risk to learn and make it a better round, to stand taller next time because he took the risk to practice? Think what I could have taught him on the other side. Never take the risk to do it till you can do it right. Never show initiative. Wait till I tell you you can do it. And then look at his potential, where it would have gone. You with me there? So I think that's the exciting thing we bring about when we're quick to see 
the potential in something rather than point out where it fell short of our expectation. Okay, now let's drop to the last one. Number five on the hit parade, <laughs> okay, of losers, uh, is the ism. And Carl Jung, a famous uh, psychologist, said that isms are the viruses that destroy human culture. In the physical world, an ism is usually a degenerative illness of some kind. I believe that in the world of interpersonal relationships, the ism is one of the more toxic things because, as we discussed in another tape, when you work with people's perceptions, they are always unique and cumulative and must be supported before you can work on changing them. Uh, but the ism works against all of those principles. See if you can pick it up. Here's a supervisor ism. You know our policy on that. Now, see, how do I know you know our policy on that? We've been debating our policy ever since I came to work here, and we're not that clear. But you see, I assume because we handed it to you the day you came here amidst all that papers that you totally understand it. If I had respected you, which is the alternative, I would have said, what is your understanding of our policy on vacation leave? And then we could have worked together with dignity to bring ourselves into the same ballpark. Here's a teacherism. You should understand this. I explained it yesterday. Look at the arrogance behind that. Every word that comes out of my mouth is totally clear. Can any of you think of a single word in the English language that doesn't have multiple meanings? And that's one of the places we confuse kids. We give them tests on comprehension that say, what is the meaning of that paragraph? When there could be a thousand meanings in it, we should have said, what meanings did you find in that paragraph and begin to teach them uh, to think and share ideas. But we teach them only the narrowest, most defensive way and then wonder why they're intimidated to think, offer ideas along the way. If that teacher truly respected kids, they would have said, what things that I explained yesterday can you think of that would apply here? And then create an open forum to teach and influence each other. I find very frequently espousism. I came home the other day and heard the Archie Bunker type that lives near me uh, dealing with his significant other this way, okay? Well, I guess I shouldn't say significant other because it's very clear from his point of view she's an insignificant other, uh, probably just a wife at this point, okay? <laughs> I believe that to be a significant other may be an upgrade uh, <laughs> over a wife if you view that as some dumb chattel that should be waiting on you all the time, which he clearly does. And so I came home and I heard this. Where are my brown pants? You knew I needed them from the cleaners every week. It's the same thing. I can't earn living naked. <laughs> now just compare that, if you would. With honey, what was your understanding of what I planned to take with me on this trip? Well, to tell the truth, dear, we never discussed it. Ah, then that could explain why my brown pants aren't here. Yes, as far as I know, you never took them to the cleaners, did you? I thought you were going to do that. Well, dear, you've been so fussy about your pants the last several weeks. I knew you'd want to take care of something that critical yourself. <laughs> okay. But I tell you what, if it's real important to you and I get the opportunity this week, I'll try to drop them off and they'll be here for your next trip. Now in either case, he has no brown pants. But if he goes on like this, he soon has no wife, uh, no children, no closet to put them in. He has alimony, child support, <laughs> efficiency apartment, and a therapist saying, what's your under... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, along the way. And that's how we open it up. Now, if we think about it for a moment, which one of those approaches says love, care, dignity, respect? Which one says hostility, aggression, insensitivity, lack of respect? It becomes the worst of all when you take a child who's never been an adult. And then expect that child who's never been an adult to think, act, act, understand, see things as an adult. As adults, we could remember what it was like to be a child, but we choose not to in our arrogance. And yet all we're teaching that child is the last thing on earth you ever want to be is that kind of person. Who would want to be an insensitive, judgmental, intolerant, angry, frustrated person who puts you down if you don't see what they see? You see, respect would be with a child. Honey, let me be sure. I understand what you were trying to do. When I left home this morning, what was your understanding of what I would need you to do after school? Okay, what you're doing this afternoon is not exactly what I had in mind, so maybe we were unclear in our discussion, so I'd like to discuss it with you now and decide what else needs to be done and how long it'll take you to do it to bring that job up to where I need it. Tell me that's not going to produce better results, and that's it. I'm sick of telling you, you stupid nincompoop. Why can't you ever, how come you never surely realize how many times do I have to tell you? I have a quick question for you. 
How many of you see at least one of these barrier behaviors as we've discussed it that you regularly use with someone you love? Okay. How many honestly believe that if you did it once less often this next week than you did last week, things would start to improve for you? And see, this is the one place where you can get instant results. It's amazing. Over the years, how many people have said, I was totally overwhelmed at the possibilities that emerged within a couple of days once I stopped getting in my own way on this. I think it's a very, very powerful thing. And see, remember, this is a place where less is a success. So how many will make a personal commitment to me right now that you <coughs> will find a way consciously to do nothing once this next week when you would have done one of these instead? Okay? Here's the easiest way to make the change. Why don't you take the mirror where you wash your face and comb your hair each morning or comb your face and wash your hair, uh, whatever your options are. You may get in that ballpark. And using lipstick, stick, tape, however you want to do it, those stick-on goodies, however you do it, why not list the barriers and make a personal project to just become sensitive to them. Go shopping for two weeks. And each morning as you get there, reflect on yesterday. How many of those did you see and what the heck was going on? After two weeks, ask yourself, which one of those did I encounter most consistently in my life as I've been aware of it? And then peel it off that mirror and consciously replace it with the builder. And then as you stand there each morning, think of one situation where last week you used the barrier and think about how you would have to approach that situation, believe and act to substitute the builder for it. Can you do that? Okay, let me also underscore that Remember in our previous discussions about changing behavior, don't rush home and announce your intention to be different. Mm -hmm. Or everybody in your family will put on this, uh, show me. She's been to another workshop, but this too shall wear <laughs> off. Okay. <laughs> if there's anything that you want to change, remember the principle. Decide clearly what it is. Okay. I'm used to saying, this is what happened, this is why it happened, this is what you better do to fix it. I'm going to be more conscientious now in letting it run and then exploring the what, the why, and the how patiently with them instead of doing it for them. Maybe that's your vision. First, think about what would I have to believe about this person to do that, that they can discover insight. Then what would I have to do? I have to be patient. How do I do that? I decide I'm going to, and imagine what that feels like. Then if for 10 days you will three times a day recreate the specific vision in your mind of yourself being the way you've chosen to be, make one of those just before you fall asleep at night, after 10 days, you can stop worrying about it consciously because it's now part of you subconsciously and will begin to surface in how you do things. Let me also underscore that you do not have to be perfect at anything we discuss to be credible and effective. The beautiful thing we have going for us is those we love want to see us in the most positive light imaginable no matter what we do. I've interviewed too many thousands of people abused by their spouse, abused by their children who still break their neck to show me the most positive possible vision of that person. Human beings are the greatest natural statistician on earth. They will cross entire oceans on only the belief it's a little better on the other side. I can put you in a and I'll put you in a laboratory and require you 1,000 times to do something and show that 490 times you choose to do it this way, 510 times you prefer to do it the other way. And then I go out and interview all the people that know you, none of whom was there. And I'll find four out of five will say, well, I believe he would prefer to do it this way, and they'll be right. They got you. They picked it up. Follow me home from this program. Let me say to my daughter, why can't you ever? How come you never? Surely you realize. Did you can't do? You will, you won't, you are you, aren't you? Pick that up, put that away. It's time for your shower now. Grounded forever. <laughs> and then let me walk away. And you walk up and say, what's going on with your dad? As long as she turns to you and said he must have had a bad trip to California, <laughs> he's not usually that way, why don't you give him a few minutes to relax and then let's go see what we can do to help him chill out and get it together. You know, I got enough credit in my account to come credibly through my bad days. So follow me home, let me dump like that. And the minute you walk up and say to her, what's going on with your dad? And she says, that's how he usually is when he gets home. I try not to be here, but I blew it this time. Let's get high, get loaded, get stoned, but get away from him. You know, I haven't got enough credit in my account that I'm going to make it. Those of you that understand business, can you stay in business and even get credit on 51%? Can you? You can. As long as you're making 51% on 
on your time and effort, you can stay in business and even get credit under certain circumstances. How many of you can do it on 49%? No way you're going to make it on 49% coming through. But you can, when push comes to shove, convince people that since you're getting ahead slowly, if they're patient with you, you'll pull through because the odds are in your favor. So I did want to share that and say this is the most exciting part and the easiest to implement part of what I've discovered about developing capable people. Remember that all relationships and all human beings are like bank accounts. If you don't put deposits in when you don't have to, there are no resources there to cover a withdrawal in a form of stress or challenge when life confronts us with one. And so put these little things in, you'll have a lot more to work with. Thank you. For more information on other books and tapes by H. Stephen Glenn, contact Sunrise Press by calling 1-800-456-7770. Or write to Sunrise Press, P.O. Box 788, Fair Oaks, California, 95628.